So I, I started Aikido in 1985 in Dallas, Texas, in Seirokan Aikido, which is kind of a, a key-based style of Aikido. Yeah. And I, I was with my, my first teacher, Bill Sosa Sensei, and um, he got me all the way up to my, my Shodan in there, in Seirokan. And then, and then I went to Japan in 80... I went for two months in 88, and then I went again in 89 to, to move back and live there. And I, I basically moved to Iwama, uh, Japan, to, to train with Saito Sensei. And I, I, I was Uchideshi for a year with Saito Sensei, and then I ended up staying there for another seven years, living about a, you know, ten minutes away from the dojo. And um, altogether, I was eight years in Japan, practicing Aikido full time. You know, first of course as Uchideshi, but then also as Sotodeshi. And uh, I had a job teaching English where I was working about 15 hours a week, which gave me a lot of time to to just train, 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 and and learn Japanese culture and, and read and study the philosophy and spirituality and meditate and and uh, spend time with other a few other friends who were also kind of living in Iwama. It was really great because we went to Japan and you know I, I I moved from pretty much mainstream America to Japan, the countryside, and back then there was. Um, I mean, they had TV, but I didn't have a television, and I didn't have a phone. For the first few years, I didn't even have a phone, so there was no TV, no phone. Uh, I think I had a, something to play music on, but there was no radio or anything like that, so certainly no internet back then. Mm-hmm. So it was really just kind of living a life in, in, in Japanese culture, but in the countryside, and it was quite secluded. And uh, really just kind of, you know, incubating for eight years. And also teaching English. So, and, and you know, I have to say that my first experience teaching really came through English, um, and you know, learning how to teach and facilitate a group, a group of people through a learning process. And then, about the fifth year that I was there, I, I started teaching Aikido in Japan. Uh, I had a couple of different places that I was teaching Aikido, and um, it was interesting because I was I was very much kind of in the Iwama tradition, and I was kind of in that first developmental stage of, of shuhari, you know, the kind of the, where you acquire the form, mm-hmm. where you conform and you copy your teacher completely, don't ask questions, just kind of mm-hmm. in the traditional uh, Japanese classical mm-hmm. old school learning method. And, um, and then when I started teaching, I was still in that kind of that, that shu stage, that, you know, conforming to the style form. So I started teaching and, and um, I was also, at that time I'd been in Iwama Dojo long enough to start translating. So I would basically translate Saito Sensei's classes, and I would go and, and train, of course, and then I would go and teach my two classes a week, and I, was, I would teach exactly what he taught, and I would say it in exactly the same words that he taught. And one of the classes was international, so it was Japanese and English, but I'd still use his didactic. The other class was just Japanese, so I would teach in Japanese. And then, um, and then I would, I, there, was, there was, well, this is not really a short explanation, but, but I had a very interesting kind of, period of a teach it wasn't officially a formally a teacher's training but it was an, it was probably the best teacher's training experience I could have ever had because Saito Sensei had a really unique um, teaching method uh, he was very didactic much more than the traditional Japanese other teachers he would speak a lot and, and really explain a lot and um, and he had this weird thing where he would teach a class on fr- the two the two popular classes in Iwama were Friday night and Saturday night Dojo was full um, and he would teach a class on Friday night, and he'd kind of repeat the class on Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, was, I would translate for him on Friday night. He'd teach the class, I'd translate. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go do the weapons class, 6 o'clock. Then I'd go into Mito, and I'd teach two classes on Saturday. I was teaching two, and I just copied what he taught, both of those classes. Mm-hmm. Did exactly what he taught, used the exact same words. Then I would go back to the dojo on Saturday night, and he would repeat the class again. Mm-hmm. So I would see the class, translate it. Mm-hmm go teach exactly the same two class, two times teach the same class. Mm-hmm. Then I go back to dojo and see the class again, practice it and translate it. Mm-hmm. So in a way I got this, you know, I got this, this is how, it, this is how to teach it. I would go teach it and then he'd say, so, that, so did you teach it like this? Now of course he didn't say that to me, but that was, that was kind of the way I, I started to learn how to teach Aikido. And it was a really amazing experience. I was doing, and I was still training 20 hours a week, so it was like full time. <clears throat> and um, I just, like I said before, I stuck to the, to the form, I really conformed, and Saito Sensei made it clear that you know don't do anything outside of the form. You know, don't do anything strange. Don't don't be creative, basically. You know, because we're preserving O Sensei's Aikido, so you have to do that. And even though I was never really a preservationist, of course I, I did that because I was you know I I listened to my teacher. But then after uh, and plus I didn't have the confidence to teach my own thing back then. I was still kind of and that, that that's good. That's I think it's important that we copy and follow 
what we taught up to a certain point. And then as I started to kind of naturally feel more confident in that and starting to kind of explore and, and create my own classes, you know, design my own classes a little bit differently, um, you know, after about a year and a half, two years, I started to explore a little bit more. And I always had, you know, the traditional didactic of Saito Sensei to fall back on. But then I started to kind of create my own classes. And then when I left Japan after eight years, I was invited around to teach a lot of seminars. And, and the reason I was invited, because I had been in the traditional, you know, home of Iwama for so long. So I'd go, and that was always our starting point. But then I also started to kind of open up and be a little bit more free and expressive in how I was teaching. So that was the beginning of kind of evolving into my own teaching style. And uh, quite now, uh, now um, it's quite different from what, what I learned. Yeah, I don't, I don't stick to the traditional Iwama style, although it's my spine, it's my core, it's, it's in me. And I stand firmly on that foundation, but I've also kind of evolved and developed into my, my not just my own Aikido style, but my own teaching style. And there's been also influ you know, influences, not just from my core teacher in Aikido, but also from my, my core meditation teachers and uh, integral teachers and, uh, and, and other kind of spiritual teachers from different traditions have had a big influence on, on, on who I am, and then who I am becomes a natural expression of how I, how I teach Aikido. And right now you're based in Israel, Tel Aviv, your, your dojo? Right, you know, which is a long story, but you know, I'm, I'm living in Tel Aviv, yeah. I live in Tel Aviv, I have my dojo, it's the integral dojo. We've been open now for about, I think we're getting close to the seventh year. Uh, development that is a developmental art. And I don't mean developing a better, faster, stronger kotegashi, a better, faster, stronger technique, which of course you will. Uh, hopefully, you know, you, you'll, you'll continue to develop, but no matter where you're at or who you're with or who you're learning from, there's, 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 there, there's the leading edge of their technical level. And you can always learn that and develop up to that level and it'll become like a glass ceiling. You won't go beyond it unless there's somebody that can show you a way beyond it and there's always more teachers out there to show us. But that's not what I mean by when I'm saying development. I'm talking about adult developmental psychology, which basically means that we evolve as human beings uh, in the interior. So techniques are exterior. So if I'm like a macho idiot, just kind of give a you know, stereotype, I can still get better, faster, and stronger. I can have the best technique, best kotegashi in the world. But the way I relate to that technique, and certainly the way that I relate to my partners, will always be a, a, a macho idiot, for example. So my technique can, if, if, if I start out, I'm a macho idiot down here, kind of low-level development, my technique grows, I'm still going to be a macho idiot. So when I talk about development, which is what kind of turns me on in Aikido, I don't mean developing technical form. I'm talking about the internal development, the way a person internal, uh, develops at the level of consciousness. And they move from, again, if I just use that stereotype of the macho idiot, they move from being a little bit more sensitive and receptive and uh, 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 what's less macho, more sensitive, more receptive, more compassionate, uh, more empathy. These types of things begin to develop on their interior and the technique will continue to also develop. Who knows, maybe the technique might, might even just plateau and start to... But as long as the human being, the individual is developing, that's what's really important. Because at the end of the day, you know, we, you can practice Aikido... How long are you doing Aikido, Narokas? Twelve. Twelve years, okay. And I often ask this in seminars that I teach. So in the twelve years that you're training and teaching, yeah. how you've done Aikido, probably... Uh, sorry, you've done Kotegashi, for example, yeah. the technique hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of times. You know? That's the practice, that technique. And how many times have you gone into daily life and ha I actually I don't know you that well, but yeah. have you ever had to use it in daily life? Yeah. Okay, it's possible that you would someday have to yeah. use it and we hope that it works. Yeah. But like in, your, in my case as well, you know, 30 years, over 30 years now, that I've never, had to, I've never used it in daily life. Yeah. Yeah, but something like center, ground, connection, yeah. uh, listening, uh, harmony, uh, facing challenges, these types of things that we do every day in class, yeah. hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times, yeah. you've done it in class. How many times have you had to do that in your daily life? Hundreds of times, thousands of times, maybe even tens of thousands of times. So this is where the value of Aikido is at. It's not, I mean, I love, I'm, I'm, I'm a technician. I love technique and I love to see really advanced and really um, subtle and sophisticated and complex technique. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not confused about what the value of Aikido training is. 
And you know, if I just go back again to this macho idiot stereotype, and it's, it's a characterization, because we all have it on a good day or a bad day, whatever. <clears throat> um, that technique can grow forever, and they may never use it in life, but the, you know, being connected and open and aware and grounded and, and all of these important, uh, the, the universal aspects of the art, which means we can do them at all times, we can practice them at all times, in all places, in all circumstances, this is where the real value of the training is at. And um, that's something that you take into, you know, hopefully, that we take into every aspect of our, of our, of our life. The development I was speaking about before is kind of an in, in interior, individual development, how a man develops, how a woman develops in, in Aikido. Uh, but, it, but we have to take that out of the individual into the collective. So how does the group, how does the dojo evolve as well? Is the dojo organized around technical strength and effectiveness, or is the dojo organized around community, or is the dojo organized around harmony, or is the dojo or organized around spirituality? Is it organized around something relative, in other words, my style, my teacher, is the most important, the best, or is it organized around, which is, to a certain extent, that can be fine, yeah? I mean, really loving who you're with is great, but it's relative. Or is the dojo context organized around something universal? Because if it's universal, anybody can walk in and relate. If it's universal, you can go anywhere and relate. If it's relative, you're gonna go other places that are not the same and you won't relate, maybe even cause problems. So we go from the individual to the collective, but if the, the community, but if we also look at the art by itself, you know, the first person is the individual, second person is the we space, it's the collective. Third person perspective is the art, it. We look at, we step back and we look at the art itself, uh, then we come to your question of, you know, of, of what, how does it compare to the tradition. And again, development is what turns me on. It, it, it turned me on is kind of a strange way to say it, but it's where it excites me. That's, that's where the juice is. That's, for me, that's, that's where it's important. It, we're not, we're, if we're not doing that, what are we doing? And that means things have to evolve. That means things have to grow. That means when they're, not, when they're lesser developed, it's totally fine. Because that's the developmental station. And the only way they can evolve to the next station is to be healthy at that level. So, you know, if you look at traditional forms of Aikido, or martial arts for that matter, I mean, we're, since Aikido is Japanese, we're looking at Japanese culture, but it doesn't have to be Japanese culture. Uh, you know, all cultures have their traditional aspects. Um, traditional Aikido is, is, is cool, it's great, you know. It, it's, it's, it's the ground that we stand on. It's the, it's the station, one of the stations is very important. If you are rebellious, and um, anti-authority and anti-meritocracy and stuff like that, then it's, it's good to get into a, a traditional context because it teaches conformity, it teaches hierarchy, hopefully in a healthy way, you know, not in a negative, uh, not in a rigid way. Uh, it teaches, health, it teaches uh, uh, healthy conformity, healthy hierarchy, healthy authority, you know, if you really have a healthy leader, let's say, or a respectful leader. Um, and, and healthy development. You really, you become shaped according to that tradition. And that's, that can be a good thing. Many traditions have shadows and dark sides and dogma and, you know, power and all this other stuff. And that's just human nature. Um, but I would say that a tradition that's kind of struggling with those shadow issues is still, that's, all, that's their developmental challenge at that level, to get them clean and clear at that, at that level. And once, once we become healthy, it's like, you know, when you become, my, my daughter now, she's playing around here, she's two years and eight months, and she's, right now, her, she's just boundaries, forget it, you know, the boundary game is over, you know, so don't do that, she does it, don't go here, she goes, it. That's, that's the, and, and in a way it drives us nuts as parents, because we're always like trying to, you know, make sure she doesn't fall down the stairs like she did this morning. But at the same time, that's, that's her developmental, that's, she, that's what is expected. If she wasn't doing that at this age, something would be, you know, yeah. off in her development. So cool, as a parent, it's like, okay, so now we got to, you know, we got to give a little bit of space so she can learn boundaries, and, you know, maybe learn when she goes too far and learn when it's not far enough. But at the same time, we want to be there and, you know, encourage healthy development through that. With children, it's, you know, that's just how it is. But it's the same thing with an individual, same thing with the community, as I said before, and then same thing with the art. So um, that's the healthy thing about tradition. Uh, problem on the problematic side is that you know you and me probably were not raised in. Actually, I don't know much about your history, but we probably weren't raised. I, I wasn't raised in a very traditional culture. I was raised in a very postmodern culture, 
equality, men and women equal, uh, um, uh, post-religious, very, I had zero religious uh, culture growing up, and, um, you know, spiritual but not religious, and, and uh, all perspectives are good, and, you know, everybody's equal, and everybody's got a, their own truth, and all, the, all of these kind of postmodern, you know, beautiful aspects of postmodernism. That perspective and, and, and traditional perspective, they don't even meet. And when they do meet, it's usually a clash. It's like, hey, you know, what, what's going on? So, you know, you go from traditional to modern to postmodern to hopefully an integral level of development. And uh, what's important at the integral level of development is that you, you kind of understand the function of the traditional, if we just stick to Aikido, the, the function of the traditional level of Aikido is to teach respect, to teach conformity, to teach discipline you know, to teach a higher path, you know, traditions are, traditional spiritual practice, martial arts, about walking a path, that means that we take a higher path of the higher discipline, and when the lower aspects of the ego are challenged, we, we, we choose the warrior's way, the spiritual warrior, we choose the values of the path, we never abandon the values of the path for the ego's personal fears or desires, and that's, that's what tradition is the best at. When we're grounded there, then we can go into a little bit more of a, uh, a modern perspective, which is really around individuality. The individuality, number one, is valued over the group, over the collective, and um, and rationality is also. So you know, in, in in traditional trainings, when the teacher says jump, you say you say yes, or you say how high or how far. Yeah. You don't you don't question it. But in a, a modern rational, when the teachers, if if you're standing on a mountain, the teacher says jump, you say. Well, you say why? You know, you've got to have a rational. You got to have a. What's the reason for doing this? It's not just about following orders. So, rational, the rational mind and critical reason is valued over conformity, because we all have the capacity to kind of think as individuals and have rational. You know, in the traditional level, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny are real at a rational level. They will. Maybe for kids, it's a nice game to play, but no, they don't exist. So. What does Aikido look at a rational level? Where we actually start to, okay, sure, there's a function for the hierarchy because we can teach and we can learn that way. It's a developmental thing. But we don't necessarily have to believe the dogma. We can challenge the dogma. We can question that. We can, we can question, uh, you know, we know that the teachers are, are good, but they may, they may be perfect in their Aikido, but they might not be perfect human beings. So we start to have our own rational understanding of that, and that's really important. And then if we move to a postmodern level, then it becomes more of a subjective thing. And we start to understand that everybody has their own perspective and everybody has their own worldview according to their history and their education and their, their, their past experience. And, um, and we start to, and, and, and that becomes the value. Pluralism becomes the value. Relativism becomes the value. And those three, those three levels of development, Aikido looks different at each one of those levels. Traditional level, it's kind of like the army. Everybody conforms and you sit in line 30 minutes before the teacher walks in. He walks in, you bow, you train like hell. He says, finish, you bow, he leaves, you're still sitting there, you bow to your partner, you sweep the dojo, clean, what, what, you go. You're traditional, you know, you've, you've been Uchideshi, you know what it's like. That's a big part of it. And it's good. When it's healthy, it's healthy. Modern level, maybe we're into achievement, you know, really healthy achievement, not, not this kind of negative achievement that we often see in our, in our culture. But we're into, uh, you know, you go for it, you, you set a goal, you, you create a strategy, you go for the goal. Um, we might even... You might even uh, be in a little bit of a competition with your, let's say again, healthy competition with your friend who's also the same level, so we're both going to go for the next rank, and we kind of, you know, health in a healthy way compete with each other, push each other a little bit. Of course, that has a shadow to it, but, you know, in this kind of modern level development, the individual is valued, so it's like you can go for it. Um, uh, now, traditional level has problems, modern level has problems, shadow as well, but if it's healthy, then you move to the postmodern, and it's like, hey, suddenly we're in this together. And we're here to actually commune. The next rank, the next, the next level is not really my goal. I'm not. I'm not even. I, I'm not about doing anymore. I'm about being. You know, you go. You shift from the. You know, it's not that I'm about doing. I'm about being. It's like I'm not about doing. I'm. A, we're about being. You know, we're we're finding this communal context where we relate, and everything becomes uh, intersubjective or subjective. The we is actually valued. Mm -hmm. So these are three different levels of development. Aikido looks very different. In, um, in the postmodern level, the principles are highly emphasized. Techniques are, uh, I mean, every, every, every school has its own uh, standard, let's say, but techniques are usually at the, at the most 50-50, sometimes even, even reduced, you know, the energy and how we relate and the principles is really what's most important. And, um, and for sure, the way that, that we feel as human beings and we feel as a group is, 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 is quite highly valued. 
and it's more it's a more compassionate kind of aikido postmodern aikido it's a more um, inclusive type of aikido it's less hierarchical you know there may be the hierarchies teachers or whatever but it's more a little bit more sometimes even we stop using terms of uh, like sensei and stuff like that and we just start you know at this level if we're all equal let's take away all the titles and you know really be equal so you, that, that all, modern post uh, traditional modern postmodern is reflected in culture but it's also if you look at if you go to cultures where that's where their center of gravity is traditional or modern or postmodern, the Aikido is going to have that flavor. It's going to have that kind of uh, uh, worldview as well. So, um, in my case, I was born in a tradition. I was born in a postmodern context, and I had very little traditional education. No, very li no religious culture. Uh, my school was kind of traditional, but you know, also postmodern. And for me, going into sports which is hierarchical and, you know, in conformity and going into martial arts, especially going into Japan, was in a way filling in that missing piece in my own development. So I kind of went back and I really old school, traditional, good old fashioned Aikido martial arts Budo training was really good for me, actually. And then also at a certain point, I realized that there's a limitation there and I can stay within that box. But but part of me was so much bigger than the box. You know, I mean, women, I'm sorry, are equal to men. And, you know, you look at a traditional structure, the women, if the women are there, they're sweeping the dojo, they're serving the tea, they're cute, they're doing, you know, even if they get, they're like cute and whatever, it's just, it's just, they're really seen as something different. It's a man's world, it's a macho world. Even when it's compassionate and not so macho, still the women are the ones serving teas. You go to Japan, it's like, you know, that's how it is. There's a lot of good women, don't get me wrong, but when it's time to serve tea, the women are the ones serving the tea. What the hell is that? You know, from somebody coming from a postmodern world, it's like, hey, that's crazy. I mean, we can accept Japanese culture, it's not a problem. But when we get to the postmodern level of development, then it's like, hey, we're all equal here. Yeah, there should be an equal amount of women teaching as men. If the culture is postmodern, you will see that. If the culture is less than postmodern, you won't really see that. You might see a few women teaching, but they're usually going to be teaching like men or doing Aikido like men, because that's what's valued. And they, you know, like that first wave of feminism really had to push back against a, a male... A, a, a culture dominated by men, so there was this kind of masculine edge of the pushback. Now, as that, that first wave of feminism has passed, the women are becoming more, much more receptive. They're kind of getting more back in their, their natural uh, state, in, you know, where, where they kind of instinctually exist. But um, so th this kind of cultural aspects are playing out in our Aikido all the time, and they're playing out in every dojo. So traditional is important. Um, but I think that it's it's important as a as a as a developmental step that that needs to be healthy, and it's important that we move to a modern structure, and it's very important as a developmental step that needs to be healthy, and it's important that we move to a postmodern structure, which is very which needs to be uh, developed and needs to be healthy, and even we need to go beyond that, which is kind of into an integral structure that recognizes all of these things as good, that they're fundamentally there's not a problem. Traditional Aikido is great. Modern Aikido is great. Postmodern Aikido is great because it's in it's in me. I've developed through all of those, and I understand that everybody has to develop through that. So I know I'm talking a lot, <laughs> but development, which was what kind of turns me on about Aikido, when we understand that development is as as an orienting generalization in the level of consciousness, we all develop in a very specific, a very stage specific ways. That you and I are completely different human beings with life experience that we're going to learn and develop in different ways. But if we look back over time, we'll see that development goes from kind of, you know, this conformity level to this kind of individual level to this kind of pluralistic level and then hopefully into an integrated level where you understand all, all levels. I would say that human, human culture is moving towards that. Um, and what I'm calling integral is, is actually kind of called, a, it's a movement, it's called the integral, integral theory and integral perspective. Um, it, it's, it is, it is a, an emerging perspective in human culture, but it's still relatively small percentage that are actually working from that level. And postmodernism, like from, you know, from Europe, Northern Europe, parts of the United States, you could say are pretty solidly postmodern. But other parts of Europe, other parts of the United States are still modern mostly modern. Some parts of Europe, some parts of the United States are still traditional. And other parts of the world, they're not even modern yet. You know, I mean, Israel's kind of, where I live, Israel, it's kind of modern, 
traditional modern with some postmodern. But the surrounding countries and, you know, and the West Bank, is, you, you came with us to the West yeah. Bank, right? Yeah. So it's still traditional, you know, traditional with some modern. Yeah. And that's not to say that they're at a lower level of development. It, it, I mean, that's the tricky thing we've got to be careful with. It's not, it's not ranking and valuing people at different levels. It's just recognizing that the way people organize and the per worldview they have is a developmental thing. And, you know, the traditional worldview doesn't understand pluralism. It can't. It's not there yet. It has to kind of move into modernism before I can understand postmodernism. Yeah, for sure. That that that's. I mean, evolution seems to be kind of happening that way. Um, it, the whole system could break down, and you know, it could kind of collapse, and we fall back, whatever. Uh, you know, a Holocaust or something like that. But if things stay stable, then we we do continue to evolve. So you've probably seen Aikido. In your 12 years yeah. career, you've probably seen some change yeah. in general in the culture. You're probably even involved with helping that change. And you know, back in Lithuania, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in my 30 years, I've seen a big change in, in you know in the general development of Aikido mm -hmm. as as a, as an art, as a collective, and then as an art. And that's definitely moving in, in a good direction. So I do see it moving in that direction. But we have to understand it's like a pyramid. So that the top of the pyramid is this kind of let's let's just say integral level of development, five percent of the Western population, five percent. The next level is pluralistic level. Postmodern is twenty, thirty, forty percent in some places, and then modern is another twenty, thirty, forty percent, and then traditional. So at the, bo the the bottom of the pyramid is always the widest. So most of the people are going to be at that traditional, even pre-traditional level of development, and then as you go up, you know, in a healthy if it's a healthy developmental structure. There's always going to be fewer that are that are at the leading edge of, of evolution, but those are the ones that are kind of laying down the tracks for the others to emerge. And it, it's just so you don't get the idea that the people listening to this don't get the idea that it's that it's kind of ranking and setting up levels that marginalize you know, as, like a, a hierarchy, like a dominating hierarchy. It's actually not. It's a, it's a there are plenty of dominating hierarchies. Especially you go around the dojos, you'll see them all the time. Um, but at the into, at the postmodern level of development, hierarchies are deconstructed, as they should be. At the integral level, hier natural hierarchies are, are honored, because natural hierarchies exist. These levels, it's not like you don't decide to move from one level to the next level. What happens is you, you, you hit the limitations of, 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 of a level, developmental level, and when you struggle with those and you push off from those levels, you're moving into the next level. So that some of the limitations, for example, of traditional Aikido is that it's a rigid hierarchy that you can become the, the teacher, the leader, the sensei, when everybody above you dies or quits. And that could take years, you know, so your lifetime as a student or whatever. Also, not a bad thing, but, you know, the moment you feel like being creative, you, you're not allowed to do that. So there's a limitation. There's no room for the individual. So you might struggle. You feel like you're growing beyond it, and, and the culture, the context won't let you. You push off from it, and, you, and when you push off, you move into the next level. And the limitations of modernism or modern level of Aikido would be individual, uh, uh, um, individual over the collective, you know, marginalizing community for the individual, which is kind of destructive in terms of a collective, uh, uh, um, achievement mentality and competition and um, ranks become more important than anything else and, and, all, and business, and, you know, business is important if you're running a dojo, as you know, but, you know, if it's this kind of slimy business and you're running a dojo and there's all kinds of, you know, bad examples, you might start to run into the limitations of the modern level of development and realize that that's not me anymore, so you push away from those. You might quit Aikido or you might decide, hey, I want to do Aikido in a different way and then you move into the postmodern level. So these developmental levels happen when you, when you evolve and then you reach the limitations of that level of development, you push off to the next level. So you evolve in it fully in that level, and you reach the limitations of level, you push off into the next level. Until you reach the limitations of, for example, postmodern Aikido is that <sighs> nobody sets goals. Nobody wants to rank. Nobody wants to take tests. I mean, taking tests is problematic, but it's also good. You know, it, it structures you in a, in a great way. Um, everybody's equal. No, everybody has to be equal. Everybody has to have a say in how we run the dojo. And so you realize that we don't get anywhere. We're just kind of going in circles. And it's like, you have to push off. Even postmodernism has its own limitations. One of them being relativism, that nobody can claim the truth. You know, one, another one being uh, uh, pluralism, that everybody has to be included. That means you let people that are included, they shouldn't be included. You know, they don't even have that developmental level to, to be aware. 
So then you see those limitations, you push off. And that, so the development happens by running into limitations of the, of the level you're at. You push off into the next level. And then, you know, those limitations energetically feel like there's a, I can't move in here, it's a small box. You push off into a place that feels like, wow, suddenly I have space. I'm able to express and be who I am at a greater, in a greater way. And that, that's kind of how evolution happens. And it doesn't matter where you're at, where you are at, but if you can kind of, if you're lucky enough to be in a dojo that focuses on this evolutionary edge, that means the edge of your, where you're comfortable and where you're uncomfortable, that kind of not so pleasant place to be, and there's a tension, it will always move you forward. It'll always move you forward. And if you go too far, you realize, hang on, I gotta go back and, and, and get, I gotta learn Ikkyo. I gotta get better at Ikkyo. Or I've gotta learn, you know, I've gotta learn the fundamentals a little bit more. Maybe I'll learn the curriculum. Or maybe I'll let it go. You know, whatever it is, if you go too far and it doesn't quite work for you, you can always fall back and then kind of solid, get that solid again and then you, you'll evolve. So in this, this way of looking at things, um, it, it, it's an external view. You know, we can sit back, that's what developmental psychology is, it looks back and sees how somebody develops psychologically. It's an external view, and we can kind of predict, not, not specifically, but in a general way, predict how things, how people evolve, and then teach in a way that will help uh, facilitate evolution. But from an internal view, there's no such thing as levels. From an internal view, there's no such thing as stages. From an internal view, there's no such thing as, as falling back or going forward. It's always in the moment. So th that's something that's really important in this integral perspective, that development is this kind of gradual s unfolding of stages on one level. And on another, from one perspective, and from another completely um, uh, 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 valid perspective, it's also always here and always now. So, you know, there's the external view and the internal view. And this is where that whole paradox starts to kind of, it's impossible to hold, it's just a contradiction. But at a certain point it becomes a paradox where you say, yeah, you can do both and you are both. And you can do neither and you're still, you know, in this kind of oneness. So, you know, often when you ask something like that, like the perfect, the ideal and the perfect, we think of some utopian idea where we're all, you know, holding hands and love, peace, and ha harmony, but, which, is, which is nice, but to be fair, if, that's, if it's like that, we don't need Aikido. Mm. You know, that's, it, it, at a certain point I realized Aikido, you know, the, the way of harmony. Mm. I think John Stevens translated it as the way of peace in one of his books, which is, it's a, it's a nice translation, and, and I get that. Mm. But I don't see it as the way of peace. Yeah. I see peace and harmony as being kind of a, a, a byproduct of what we're doing. And that, that um, what we're really doing, you know, I key is the harmonizing of energy, and that means energies that are coming into conflict. So I really think that the, the field that we walk in is, is, is conflict. So, you know, the ideal, in a perfect world of Aikido, um, it would be a place where we have as much, you know, you have, you have, you're a human being with your physical, emotional, psychological, cultural boundaries, among other many boundaries as am I. And we can hang out in a nice kind of, you know, in the mountains and everything and, you know, eat olives and cheese and drink some wine and just be in, kind of in harmony. But we hang out long enough, our boundaries are going to start bumping into each other. They have to. You know, you're, you're a human being over there, I'm a human being over here. We, we say, yeah, we both like cheese, we're in harmony around the cheese mm -hmm. until you like this cheese and I don't like that cheese. So our boundaries are going to, sma are going to rub against each other and that's conflict. That's kind of like, oh, rocus. I don't want to be around uh. That's Aikido. That's, that's where we do Aikido. We, we don't need it. Like in, right now, we don't need Aikido because it's kind of nice. You know, it's a nice day. We're hanging out. It's, it's, it's so far so good. But it's only where we have conflict is where we have Aikido. And, and this, Patrick and I talk about this a lot. I know Patrick believes this as well. Aikido is kind of the, the, it's not the only method discovered by humanity mm. to work with conflict mm. but it's what's so great about it it's probably the only embodied method mm. it's certainly the only one that's really in, in the martial arts mm. and not to put down other martial arts because there's amazing martial arts and there's amazing martial artists just like there's not so amazing martial arts and there's not so amazing martial artists but um, Aikido is 100% life affirming yeah, and again, that you, if you go with that, because like, wow, all of the martial arts, they're breaking or there's something, even when they're peaceful and spiritual, 
you look at their moves and it's about breaking and you know somebody wins and somebody loses aikido is like win-win situation it's a it's it's not consensus it's it's synthesizing into a greater way so my boundaries run into your boundaries and there's three things that can happen i can dominate you I feel satisfied, but you don't. You dominate me with your cheese, and you know, I, then you feel satisfied, but I don't feel satisfied. We can agree to disagree. And that's the third option, which is, okay, you know, I got my cheese, you got your cheese. I'm 50% satisfied, you know, the hell with you. You might be 50% satisfied over there, the hell with me. But th those are the, kind of the three options. You bring in Aikido, which is, again, it's dropping in this kind of, this, 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 this spiritual, um, uh, uh, paradoxical art where we find another way, a fourth way where we enter into it and, you know, with some the right intentions, some technical or, or some internal and external competencies um, and, um, you know, a prayer, a little grace. We're able to fully go into our differences, fully go into the conflict, and come out of it the other side in a, as a, in a greater whole, where your boundary and my boundary are no longer like that, but we've, we've grown into a greater boundary. And in that greater boundary, that greater perspective, you're still 100% satisfied, and you've got your cheese, for example, and I'm 100% satisfied, and I've got my cheese. So again, in, in the old conflict model, in the common conflict model, there's you and me, that's 100%. If I win, I get 100%, you get zero. If you win, I get a zero, you get 100%. If we agree to disagree, you get 50, I get 50. But the, the result, is the, the, the resolution in Aikido is 1,000%. It's no longer 100 and 100. It doesn't even equal 200, it equals 1,000, it equals 10, that equals a million. We create a whole new kind of level. It's like you look in nature, the most dynamic parts of nature is when one ecosystem is bumping into another ecosystem. And it may be dominated, and one ecosystem may kill the other ecosystem, or vice versa. Or they may grow into a new ecosystem, you know, a, a new evolutionary step where they come together in a new way, and all those organisms and beings and animals start to relate and create a new ecosystem. That's happening in nature all the time. Yeah? And that's why Aikido, as, in that, as an expression of the harmony of nature, the way harmony happens through conflict, um, is such a beautiful, amazing art. So it would it would it would uh, it would reflect what Aikido actually is, where we you know we enter into harm we enter into conflict willingly, and sometimes you know like crazy because we know that we can't see any solution, but with the right intention and, and we we always evolve into a higher way, and if we don't evolve into a higher way we're patient with that and we we've got the capacity to be okay with that. 